Welcome back to Banner Monday here at the Assembly Call. We don't just want to make you a smarter IU basketball fan. We want to make you a smarter basketball fan, period. And that is the purpose of these Basketball 201 segments. You already know the basics of the game, but in this segment, we go next level to dissect the concepts and strategies that teams employ in the pursuit of victory. Pay attention to these segments, and you'll have a deeper understanding of what's going on out there on the court while you're watching IU play. And as we had in our first two installments of Basketball 201, we are very pleased to have Ben Ladner back with us, a senior at IU this year, one of our interns, both at the Assembly Call and Podcast on the Brink. Someone asked me earlier today what you're majoring in. Uh, journalism. Just, just regular straight up, but they let you specialize and concentrate in certain things. So I've technically got a sports journalism okay. concentration, but that doesn't, you know, it doesn't get me out of the boring classes. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So, so we're going to talk pack line defense and uh, you know, I think most Indiana fans, you know, probably gained some understanding of the pack line last year. Obviously this is, you know, this is Archie Miller's defense. This is the defense that, you know, I'm pretty sure that his dad plays in, in high school. It's certainly the defense that Sean plays at Arizona. Um, it's, you know, similar defense, obviously to what uh, Tony Bennett is playing at Virginia. And so we've clearly seen many teams across the country have a lot of success with this defense. And so, Let's just use this segment to to give an overview, go over some of the basic concepts and tenets of the pack line, and then I know that you have a couple of videos that we want to go over. How would you describe the overall philosophy of the pack line and what you're trying to do when you're playing a pack line defense? Yeah, so the pack line is mostly it's first and foremost, it's about putting pressure on the ball. Whoever is guarding the ball needs to be up in his man, applying pressure, um, and, and you know, guarding his yard, so to speak, um, you know, making him feel uncomfortable and trying to prevent a straight line drive. And that's really what, what the whole defense is about in general is shutting off dribble penetration and eliminating looks at the basket that that's kind of at its core, what it's most about, you know, it aims to take away threes. It aims to do a lot of other things. And um, you know, that any would, any defense would, but at its core, it's about preventing dribble penetration, stopping shots at the rim. So the way they do that is they apply strong ball pressure um, with, with usually a guard, uh, who's initiating the possession. And then all other four defenders um, are in what's called gap position. And the the reason they call it a pack line is because it's sort of this imaginary line or, you know, 16, 17 feet, a couple steps inside the three-point line, this imaginary line that the defenders kind of stay inside of or on while they're in help defense. So you've got a guy kind of at the point of attack and then two guys on the side, assuming the ball's up top, kind of in this gap position so that if a drive occurs, they're able to just slide over, rotate, stop that drive, and then recover to their man or wherever the ball gets kicked out to. Um, so just a, a little history on it. It was developed by Dick Bennett at Washington State uh, a little while, probably many, many years ago. Um, and that's, uh, I think they're the Cougars, so that's why they call it the pack line. Um, I would, oh, I, would I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, so you, you okay. mentioned Tony Bennett, Sean Miller are two guys who run it, uh, Chris Mack now at Louisville, has been known to run this defense. So it's fairly widely used uh, and it's, you know, more so in college than in the NBA, just because schematically there are certain things that, and ability wise, the NBA players are better. They're able to, you know, pick it apart a little bit easier. So it's more effective in the college ranks. You don't really see it too much at the NBA level, but I've got a quick video here that, uh, that will help kind of illustrate just some basic pack line concepts this is a video that and, and again actually... and again if you're listening on the podcast you can go to youtube.com slash assembly call find episode 435 and go to you know about the 50 52 minute mark which is when these segments usually start and you'll find it and then ben you and i are going to pull those videos out and we'll eventually have just our basketball 201 segments there yeah. they're not there yet but eventually we'll have a whole playlist just for those videos so we'll yeah. try and describe it as best we can but if you want to see the visual go to the youtube page so this is a video you know, people who have watched the last two episode, episodes may recognize this. It's one I use to demonstrate drop, pick, and roll coverage. Um, but I want to focus on a, some different elements uh, this time around. Same game against Michigan uh, in Ann Arbor, as we touched on uh, the first time we watched it. Not a great showing for Indiana. Uh, this is uh, They're already down 14 points, 12 minutes into the game. But a strong defensive possession here nonetheless. It starts with a ball screen by Michigan. Mo Wagner comes up. Left side of the floor, they're trying to go middle. Wagner sets the screen on Josh Newkirk, who's guarding the ball. Jawan Morgan comes up to, to play the ball. But what I want to focus on here is where Colin Hartman is. You see him as the ball gets as, as the ball screen is set, Hartman rotates over and he's standing, you know, basically at the foul line. And his man is is kind of more over on the wing, but 
in the pack line defense, the principles dictate that these two guys, Colin Hartman up top, and then Zach McRoberts, who's defending the guy in the corner, these guys are basically on the midline of the paint. And that's, you know, that's part of stopping that dribble penetration. If the ball handler turns the corner and goes middle, Colin Hartman is there and the ball's not going to get through the middle of the paint because you've got two help defenders there. Now it does give opportunities to, you know, make this pass one pass away or make the skip pass to the corner. If the ball handler is adept enough to do that, but really, I mean, you you can tell they're, they're really forming a wall around the paint and they're not going to let anyone get in the middle and get a shot at the rim. So we see the ball handler. We'll rewind it a little bit. Come around the screen, Morgan drops. Nice job on the on the two-man coverage. And Colin Hartman kind of stays there in the middle. And then when the ball's kicked out to uh Duncan Robinson here on the wing, it's on it's it's incumbent upon this man who's the helper one pass away. He needs to sprint over, and especially on a guy like Duncan Robinson who can shoot a little bit, needs to sprint over and close out, which Hartman does, forces the drive, and then on that second drive by Duncan Robinson, you can see Josh Newkirk. He's not hugging up against his man. A lot of man-to-man principles uh, will will dictate that if you're one pass away, you're what's called on the line, up the line, where you know this guy instead of standing here at the in the the top of the key like Newkirk is here would have you know his back turned to the ball with a hand out in ball denial position to make sure this guy doesn't get the ball back. The pack line it's a little bit of a softer man-to-man at least on the ball. So Hartman's applying the ball pressure here. Newkirk one pass away. Robinson tries to drive here and attack this closeout, but because of the help, he's not able to. So then he has to kick it back out and Michigan resets the possession. They don't get anything out of it. And there's seven on the shot clock. So, um, you know, that that's a, a pretty good job there by Indiana. And then the whole time McRoberts is over here kind of keeping tabs on his man in the corner, ready to help and be this last line of defense. If it would have come to that. So, you know, Essentially, the philosophy here is the highest percentage shot is a shot at the rim. So you're trying to right. keep guys from being able to just drive in and get some of those easy shots, which we saw, unfortunately, all the time in the Tom Crean era. Yep. This defense is designed to prevent that and also to try and just prevent that kind of penetration into the middle that can really just completely discombobulate your defense. Yeah. Now, it, dispel a myth or, I guess, you know, perpetuate it if you want to. But obviously last year, you know, with a few of the outlier games that Indiana had against Indiana State and Fort Wayne, and then, you know, you saw what happened to Virginia against UMBC and everybody really, really, you know, just kind of like latched on to that. And you got this little groundswell of fear that the pack line defense can't defend three point shots, despite the fact that Virginia annually is one of the best teams in the country at defending yeah. the three. And the evidence doesn't really back that up. But you can see even from that video, like there are going to be some opportunities for, you know, if you have a guy with some vision and the ability to deliver a pass, you're, you know, guys are going to have the opportunity to get the ball in position to shoot some threes. So, number one, do you think the pack line is particularly vulnerable to three point shooting? And number two, what do you need maybe in terms of personnel or how you particularly play the pack line defense to help defend the three point shot, which we know is becoming increasingly more important. Yeah, I I agree. I think it is vulnerable to threes. I think, um, you know, like you said, Indiana state, Fort Wayne, these guys with some shooting big men in particular, but really any team with good shooters, you know, when you've got those guys who aren't hugging up on the shooters, one pass away, they're kind of more sagging into the paint and, and shutting off the drive, you know, if you're able to get past your man and draw that help defender, it's just one simple kick out pass. And if it's a good shooter, you know, that that's a 35, 40% shot, which, you know, you, you add those up over the course of a game and it really does hurt you. So uh, that's actually one of my biggest misgivings about the pack line defense is just, you know, before there was this big emphasis and kind of people kind of realized the value of the three point shot before that really happened, you know, the pack line was, was a, a great defense to play in the college ranks because, you know, teams were, they were, they were offenses were about getting to the basket, getting the highest percentage shot. But, you know, as people have kind of come around to the idea of, you know, points per shot and effective field goal percentage and things like that, where, you know, that, that show that three pointers are obviously more valuable than twos, you know, threes more than two um, with people kind of getting wise to that. I do think that you've seen teams that run the pack line, you know, struggle to defend, some three point shooting teams. Now, Virginia, you brought up them as a a team that defends the three pretty well. Uh, And that actually ties into your second question, which is uh, what you need to kind of combat that. I think having good, long, active personnel can help in that just guys who can make that close out a little bit quicker, because if, you know, if you're slow recovering on a shooter 
that's going to increase the percentage that he's able to make that shot. And so if you have guys with some length, with some quickness that can get back to that shooter before he has time to get away the three, that's obviously beneficial to the defense. And you're able to kind of cover more ground, be in two places at once, uh, so to speak, and, you know, bother some of those rotation, those swing passes, those kickout passes. And then second, I think institutional knowledge. And that's where Indiana really struggled last season because they were, you know, with a first year head coach, or at least with that personnel. Um, you know, they had a lot of young guys in the rotation, uh, guys who didn't really have a lot of experience playing college basketball at all, let alone under Archie Miller in his system, playing those pack line principles. Virginia is a team that every single year has a lot of roster turnover. They get a lot of really, really smart players in that system, and they've got a great coach in Tony Bennett. And so you see a little bit more translation and a little bit more effectiveness from them just because it's almost like the San Antonio Spurs in the NBA where they kind of they're able to just plug guys into that system and make it work because everyone on the team knows it so well. They communicate really well. Uh, and so they're able to make it work. If you have a team that doesn't really grasp uh, the, the, the concepts and kind of the schemes that you want to run, it can be a little tougher. And so defensive communication is really, really key uh, because this actually ties in with hedging the pick and roll, which we'll get into the uh, there's an example of in the next video. And we talked about uh, two episodes ago, but that's one of the big things that the pack line emphasizes is they want to hedge that pick and roll. It's, it's all part of this idea of shutting off dribble penetration, stop that ball handler's path. Uh, and that forces the defense into a lot of really long rotations and it forces them to be on time with every rotation and really tied together. Otherwise you give up a passing lane and someone's able to spring open for three. So you need guys that know what they're doing and that are able to communicate and kind of move as one kind of like five guys on one string, just kind of tied in. Uh, so they never really give up those gaps. And that's what Virginia does a really good job of. And, you know, hopefully this year we'll see Indiana with another year of experience under its belt do a better job of that as well. Yeah. So fair to say is the institutional knowledge as the, as the defensive culture and just the culture of the pack line grows at Indiana, that will help. Would you say, last question before we get to your video? Yeah. Is it fair to say that this is the kind of defense that maybe if you're like at a mid-major or, or like a second-tier Big Ten school where you can't recruit top-level athletes, you should seriously question playing this? But if you can recruit like in Arizona, like Indiana should be able to under Archie, even Virginia, where you can get guys like DeAndre Hunter, where you can get big, long athletes that are good basketball players and willing defenders, then you can make this work at the college level, even despite the weaknesses, because that length and athleticism will help you cover up for some of them. Is that fair to say? Yes and no. I, I think it, it does help you cover up for some of those. Um, you know, if you have the length and athleticism, you know, it helps you cover for that mistake and it, it'll uh, expand the margin of error. But, you know, if you execute it right, if you have guys, you know, at a mid major school, for instance, that, you know, have just been playing this defense for two, three years, maybe even back to high school, and they really know what they're doing and they have a coach that teaches it really well, it can actually be an effective defense kind of at the, the lower levels of, of D1 and, and maybe in the, even in the D2 ranks. Um, you know, you just have to hope that your opponent isn't hot from three and, you know, sometimes hoping that it, it does always work in your favor. It just, it needs to be something you do. Like no one just installs the pack line for one game as like a, you know, as like a gimmick right. defense or something. Yes. Like, it's definitely something where the concepts, you know, they need to be drilled over and over and over. Um, and, and it's, it's really, I mean, it's not something you can draw up in a timeout and say, you know, Hey guys, we need to make this adjustment. Like that's, that's something that takes some, some time to get used to and not really, something you learn on the fly. Yeah. So for all those Indiana fans that want to see more of a defensive culture under Tom Crean and count me among them, you know, this is what we're getting with Archie and the fact yeah. that he's so committed to this defensive philosophy is certainly proof of that. Okay. Let's go to your next video then. Yeah. So this is actually, we talked about Virginia. This is a clip from Virginia last season. Uh, I, this was when they were, um, you know, not a, a punchline of, of every 16, one joke. Um, so this is a game against NC state. And, you know, this is a pretty classic Virginia play that we'll see here where let me see if I can play the video. There we go. So you get a ball screen and there comes the hedge. This is middle ball screen. Uh, the point guards coming off the screen and you've got the big man, the, the, the guy guarding the big man comes all the way out. Like we talked about a couple episodes ago with that hedging defense while the guard fights over the screen gives a little bit of a, a second kind of a lurch toward the ball just to give him a little bit more pressure. And then recovers back. One quick thing, if the ball handler had realized right oh, He's here, late getting back. <laughs> yeah, if the ball handler, like we, we showed that clip of the trap with Steph Curry going to Draymond Green last week. Yeah. If this guy, and you'll have to forgive me, I don't know NC State's personnel very well, but if, if this guy's able to see the roll man, and second of all, if the roll man has his head turned, this could be an effective kind of uh, pressure release. 
you do have to get it over all this length that Virginia has on the ball. But if you're able to get it out of that trap, you know, you have this guy in the corner, you have this guy in the left corner, you have a kick out pass to the wing, or you have the drive with the big man. So you've got some options coming out of that, but they don't see it. So the big man's able to recover. They swing the ball. Here comes a second pick and roll. Now we saw the first pick and roll. They wanted to hedge it because that was a middle pick and roll. And that's one of the you know main tenets of the pack line is middle pick and rolls. You hedge, stop the ball and, and kind of make it, you know, you redirect the ball handler on the side. We talked about icing the pick and roll last week on the side pick and rolls. You want to, in the, in the pack line, it dictates that you ice the pick and roll. So, uh, Hall, I think this is Hall, does a nice job forcing the ball toward the baseline. You've got your big man, you know, we talked about trapping him kind of in that no man's land in the corner using the, the baseline as kind of a third defender. They're able to force him into the corner because you're not going to get a high percentage shot from this area of the floor. And you have, notice how tied in Virginia's other three defenders are here. The only pass that's really open, and it's not really even open, is this weak side corner. But you're not going to be able to throw the ball from the right corner over all this length, you know, through these help defenders all the way to the other side of the corner. So they're fine leaving that guy open so long as they can recover once the ball is passed to someone else. So they do get it to, to yurt seven here in the high post. And then he turns his back posts up and immediately Virginia employs the double team on that second dribble. There comes the double team. Now another case of NC state not having their heads up, the power forward is wide open under the basket, but by the time Yurt Seven turns his head and sees him, Ty Jerome is already rotated over, and Kyle Guy is kind of zoning up between these two players right here. They'd be well served to have this guy rotate along the arc, kind of over to the top of the key or the right wing, just to spread Kyle Guy out a little bit and make sure that he can't guard two guys at once. But alas, they're not able to. Yurt Seven has to spin around, and they force a contested three at the end, at the end of the shot clock that's a good possession for Virginia. You know, that's what they want. They want to force these guys to, you know, to take shots that they're not super comfortable with, you know, that he wasn't able to, the shooter wasn't able to set his feet, really get his balance on that shot at all. And, and kind of had to jack one up because of how long, you know, uh, NC state had to swing the ball around and just couldn't get a good shot. Boy, and even in that clip, you saw the opportunities that NC state had, yeah. <laughs> or if they had had a little bit of vision or, you know, I guess just better players, they could have, they could have kind of taken advantage there. Now you said, okay, so they iced the pick and roll on the side. I thought in the pack line, you didn't, you didn't want to do that because you wanted to force the man back to the middle. So I, I, I have thought that as well. And I watched a couple instructional videos and it, it seems like, yeah, I think different coaches will preach it different ways because, you know, on a, on a baseline drive, you don't want to give up the baseline yeah. um, because all of your help is in the middle. So you want to force your guy that way. But, you know, some coaches will, will tell you that, you know, if the ball's on the side and, and you've got them going that direction, you know, you can, you can ice it. And, and you know, personally, I prefer icing as a, uh, a method of, of guarding the pick and roll. So you'll see it run different ways, I think. Um, and if, if anyone in the comments has any insight as to, you know, why, certain coaches might do one over the other. Um, I would certainly love to know as well. Um, we did get a couple of good questions here. So Kent says, is there any adjustment IU could make to the pack line if a team is hot from three point range, like in the Indiana state and Fort Wayne games, which I almost feel like we need to stop bringing those up as issues with the pack line, because that was, I mean, again, that was early in the season where you had a team yeah. that had a culture of no defense for a while. I mean, they were hardly playing any defense and you could tell right. how confused they were and just all the wide open shots. Plus, you know, those two teams went nuts. So we really probably should, you know, stop bringing those up constantly as examples. Like that's a problem with the pack line, but say like Virginia in, yeah. you know, in the NCAA tournament game where UMBC just went nuts on them. What kind of adjustments can you make when teams just get red hot like that? Well, in the first clip, I think was, was actually a good example of that because, you know, you noticed they dropped the pick and roll.